Very good. Uh, good morning to everyone joining us uh, via Zoom or via Facebook Live. Uh, welcome to today's event on how to build resilient democracies together. Uh, this is the fourth and concluding event in a series of meetings that have taken place over the past few months, co-organized by the Progressive Alliance and the Foundation for European Progressive Studies uh, within the framework of the preparatory events taking place and leading up to the Global Progressive Forum 2021. Now we've gallivanted the globe and after Latin America, Africa and Asia, we now turn our focus to Europe. Uh, a continent where one might have thought uh, the democracy was supposed to be most securely rooted. Uh, but sadly, painfully, we've observed that uh, our continent, uh, Europe, has not been immune to the same trends, the same dynamics that we've seen elsewhere. Democratic backsliding, authoritarian inclinations, the ascendancy of the liberal forces, the liberal movements, the growing electoral and political appeal of anti-pluralist, anti-tolerant voices, um, a systematic assault in certain cases against the values, the, the principles that underpin uh, our democratic societies, the rule of law, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, the independence of the judiciary. Uh, and of course, the spread of a disinformation of digital insecurities, polarization, fragmentation, and so on. And all of this taken together has not injured solely the quality or the depth of our democracies, but it has also moved the window of what uh, it is permissible to say and do within the democratic, uh, uh, within a democratic frame. As I said, it has triggered fragmentation and it has also shrunk, I should say, uh, to an extent, the boundaries of our uh, democratic imagination. And what I mean by that, I mean um, the things, the ability of each citizen to imagine what is possible to do within this democratic frame uh, and the, the ability of each citizen to imagine what a democracy can deliver uh, for them. Uh, in real life. Now, democracies and democracy in general is only as strong as we make it. And this is why events like this, initiatives uh, like today's event, are important not only to analyze the obvious problem that we have, um, but also offer inspiring ideas of how to overcome it, uh, how to become resilient, how to bounce back to recover and revitalize. Um, and we have a fantastic panel for us today who can help us do precisely this. Uh, but before we get to that point, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome uh, Ms. Katarina Bali, a member of the European Parliament and a vice president of the SD group there, a former minister in Germany and somebody who, works, uh, who worked uh, copiously on related issues uh, to deliver some introductory remarks into the topic. Uh, Ms. Barley, welcome, and the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Vasilis, and uh, thank you for the invitation, and thank you for hosting this very important series um, of, uh, of uh, meetings. Um, yes, you said it rightly, this has been my dedication for, for my whole professional and political life, so, so I'm very grateful for this, and thanks to the Progressive Alliance for setting it up, to you, to, to Connie. Uh, to, for, for FEPS and also for the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung to be moderating and facilitating this. Um, well, yes, uh, now when it comes to Europe, um, your questions, um, how do we make a democracy more resilient? Um, we have a few, uh, a few key points there, but um, certainly we have one big step we have taken forward for the protection of, of democracy and that is these uh, supranational entities that uh, we have uh, built. It's the European Union which is uh, democratically legitimized uh, in several ways. We have um, the European elections so we have people like Evan and myself who have been elected directly by the European people 
Um, and we have other institutions that are um, democratically set up. Um, and we have within the European Union a set of values that are enshrined in our treaties that all member states have agreed upon um, and that are the foundation of our, of our work. And we have also, I want to mention it, uh, the Council of Europe, which um, includes 47 countries, which is legitimized in a different way. The representatives are being uh, sent there by the national, um, by, the, by the member states, but they also have a very powerful court. Um, the European Union has the European Court of Justice and the Council of Europe has the European Court of Human Rights. Um, which is highly recognized and which also has a power of implementation. So um, we, I think we have a very good, like let's say outline setting um, to be a continent where democracy and fundamental rights are being respected. Still, we see that these values are heavily under pressure at the moment. Um, we see it uh, when it comes to the separation of powers, for example, which is, of course, a core part of democracy. We see that judiciary um, is in some countries not really independent anymore, that more and more governments are trying to make judiciary dependent of their political will. Um, we have... Um, uh, of course, um, parliament rights that are being um, that are being limited, the rights of individual MEP, uh, MPs that are being limited, as we see it in Hungary, for example. So we have a lot of different uh, threats and and uh, and also um, infrictions there already. We do also see attack on um, civil society, on free media, so everything that surrounds the democratic institutions that we need to uphold um, a living and, and vital democracy. Um, we see attacks on free media in several member states. Um, some of them are, are structural, some of them are by other groups, but the, um, the institutions, the public institutions not being willing or able to protect free media from that. Um, of course, um, the, the examples, you might have heard of them, it's especially Poland and Hungary up to now, um, where, for example, in Hungary, we don't see any free media uh, at all left, except for some online um, entities, almost uh, more than 500 uh, media facilities are being um, uh, being kind of included into a foundation that is close to the ruling party and controlled by it. It's called Kesma. Um, so you, and of course, we all know that if you don't have free media anymore, you don't have a, a sufficient control of power. Now, the third part, um, and that is a new quality, I would say, in Europe, is that we have the attempt of... Um, uh, of an attack on the alternation of power. Now, this, of course, is a vital part of democracy, that um, you only have power for a limited time. And we are seeing in Hungary that Viktor Orban is trying to implement his people uh, in a way in, in, in all kinds of institutions um, and posts where they cannot be removed from even if he loses the next election. And uh, he has implemented a way of turning over the elected parliament um, within a very short period of time, um, uh, even if he himself is not being re-elected. So, so this is kind of the ultimate attack that you stick to the power, even if you are not the elected a prime minister or whatever anymore. So this is uh, what we're seeing at the moment and what can be done. Um, I don't want to be too long, so, so um, I try to make it very short. The first point, of course, is we have to learn our historical lessons. I mean, um, as you, you mentioned that Europe was the continent where we 
should um, expect uh, democracy to be the most solid. Well, we have seen times when um, we have had the most terrible regimes, fascists, racists, anti-Semites, um, name it, we had it uh, in, in, the most, in the most terrible form. Now, myself being half German, um, I really know what I'm talking about there. We've seen other forms of non-democratic regimes. So I think the first point is we really have to learn the lessons of our history and we have to see the signs. We know how it starts. And this is um, what, what really gets me and what leads me to the second point. Um, because when we look at countries like Hungary or Poland, especially Hungary, we, we have seen this coming for more than 10 years and nobody has really acted. And the first actor that needs to take measures is the political family. And of course, this applies to ourselves also. If we see tendencies um, that some member party is, is not democratic or becoming less democratic, I think we need to bring up the discussion within our party family as well as we expected from others. And of course, we expected in the very first place from the conservatives who are the most affected by this. Um, all the countries that are that I've named, Poland, Hungary, um, but also Slovenia at the moment are, are conservative or further right regimes. Um, actually, we are discussing this now uh, in the minute where um, Slovenia is taking over officially the um, the presidency of, of the council and Janis Jansha, the, the prime minister, just spoke in our plenary. And um, we are seeing that he is following the path of Viktor Orban. He's doing the same things that Viktor Orban did 10 years ago. And we're seeing the conservative family making the same mistake, exactly the same mistake, saying, well, no, but he's one of us. We're going to, uh, we're going to get along with him. Uh, we're going to show him the way. And in the end, they don't because they just want um, uh, them to stay in their party family and, and they want their seats and their votes. So, um, so I think this is the very first thing. Um, the, the second one is um, that uh, we need to strengthen our own tools. Now, this is special, of course, for Europe because we have these supranational tools that we can apply. Um, we had a couple in the past, which was our European Court of Justice that I mentioned in the beginning, and we had a procedure um, how to uh, sanction member states that did not comply, which didn't work. It doesn't work at the moment because we need unanimity at the end. And of course, Poland, Hungary, Slovenia, they are now uh, three. So you can't get unanimity anymore. Um, but that should be a lesson learned. If you start earlier, if you're more consequent, then um, you can actually um, use these instruments. If they are not good enough, you have to create new instruments. This is what we have done in the last year. Um, we have created a, a rule of law monitoring report complying everyone. So every country, every member state is being, uh, is being um, checked uh, concerning the rule of law and democracy so that, it, that it's more, more or less objective um, where you stand. Um, and the second instrument is financial possibilities uh, that we can freeze money um, that goes to the member states. And as most of these totalitarian authoritarian um, regimes are also corrupt, that is really a threat for them. But that we have to apply, which is not being done at the moment. Um, and there we, we have to be stronger. Um, we also have to be um, stronger when it comes to the control of the member states themselves. We see, for example, the Netherlands at the moment being very vocal and the Netherlands uh, and member states in the European Union also have the right to sue other member states uh, when it comes to the rule of law. <clears throat> this um, has not happened very often in the, in the past, as far as I know, if it has ever happened, but um, the Netherlands were very close to um, suing Hungary and uh, I think there also we need more 
more courage um, by, by national governments and parliaments. And lastly, what we need is we have to be consistent when it comes to democratic engagement in foreign policy. We need um, to uphold standards within the European Union, but we also have to be uh, very strict when it comes to um, developing countries, well, or, or countries that, um, that want to join um, the European Union. We have to be consistent in our trade policy, in our human rights policy, et cetera. So I think these are um, the things that uh, Europe can do, the European Union can do. I just want, I'm just here to give an input, so I'm not gonna, gonna dig deeper into this, but I think that we in Europe have a unique chance because of the organizations that we have, because of the mutual trust and control um, that we have installed. Um, and it's, it's high time that we make use of it. It is becoming late, um, because because people like Viktor Orban or um, also Kaczynski in Poland, they are trying to change the European Union from within. And if they are successful, then this mutual control and this democratic structure will be gone. So we have to be very aware of this and very vocal and very firm. And this is where our party family, of course, um, is in the, in the front row and we will fight heavily for that. Thank you. Many thanks, Ms. Bali, and uh, I should correct myself, the slip of the tongue, uh, I said uh, Vice President uh, of the S&D Group, but I should have said from the S&D Group uh, in the European Parliament, so apologies for that. Uh, but mostly thank you for reminding us uh, of the importance of not being lazy, politically or otherwise, in observing the rhythmicality of history. Uh, how eerily similar certain patterns, certain dynamics are, uh, not being politically passive, um, drawing the right historical lessons. Uh, and thank you also for reminding us that of, of the unique location and position of Europe in, in fixing up the problem. We have some of the tools we need to create, perhaps new ones, uh, but we're not helpless. Uh, but in order to do that, first, we need to understand that the most damning elements of democratic backsliding that have been observed in Europe have been the outcome of our own democratic failures. And I think this is a very important lesson. Uh, many thanks indeed. Uh, we uh, refer to Hungary several times, and it's very opportune that we're joined by Lajlo Ando. Uh, Dr. Ando is the Secretary General of FEPS um, and a former EU commissioner. Um, and Dr. Andom, perhaps after these, uh, these remarks, uh, perhaps you can help us a little bit more providing an overview of the situation in Europe, but also bringing insights from the particular uh, case of, uh, of Hungary, which is very close to your heart. Uh, please. Uh, thank you very much, Vasilis. Um, uh, good morning. Um, I believe this is a very important uh, conversation and it's really an honor uh, to take the floor after uh, Katarina Barley. Um, I think um, uh, this is a, a very important session because um, in reality uh, we are not supposed to be here. We are not supposed to discuss this topic because in 1989 we were told by people including Francis Fukuyama that history would end with the victory of uh, liberal democracy and there would be no serious questioning of uh, the political principles of representative uh, democracy, uh, human rights and political uh, pluralism. So for many, this deformation, which we have been experiencing in East Central Europe and broadly speaking in Eastern Europe um, may come as um, unexpected, but obviously there are reasons. So with my scene sector, I would like to contribute to identifying uh, the reasons to why we are uh, here in this position, which was not expected by many, especially uh, Francis uh, Fukuyana. Obviously, if uh, the question is, um, you know, what the reasons um, have been, uh, we cannot reduce it to sinister individuals. 
Of course, um, with many political situations, um, there must be some evil personalities in play. Uh, but uh, political deformations, like the one we have experienced since 2010 in Hungary, or since 2015 in Poland, uh, cannot be reduced to uh, the work of a single evil individual, especially because in Poland it was a twins. So um, as opposed to Hungary, there were two leaders originally of um, this uh, uh, political uh, trend. But the point is not uh, you know, counting um, uh, the leaders, but to explore the broader uh, social and political trends. Uh, why exactly some people and uh, a very large number of people actually demand and many others accept illiberal regimes uh, in uh, this region. So the question of the demand and the accept acceptance by large numbers, uh, large sections of the population uh, must be uh, asked uh, and answered. The second point I want to highlight is that what we are facing is not simply an intra-EU problem. There are transnational networks in uh, play. Uh, you can just look at um, the, the, the extremely effective networking between people like Orban, Janša, Vucic, Gruevski, and various other uh, Southeast European uh, personalities. Um, uh, and um, obviously the consequence of um, these transnational uh, right-wing networks is uh, potentially uh, discrediting of the EU enlargement policy uh, because the European Union is only supposed to um, accept uh, uh, functioning democracies as, uh, as, as members. But um, to broaden uh, my point, I just want to stress that um, the, the, the transnational factor um, should be taken seriously so much that the separation from a legal point of view between East Central Europe, Southeast Europe, Russia, CIS um, is probably secondary because the shared historic experience with um, the transition um, after 1989 uh, creates and leaves behind many, many commonalities. So in a way, what I should challenge here is um, uh, the fallacy of disconnect. Uh, legally, uh, these post communist countries fall into different uh, categories. On the other hand, uh, there, uh, there continues to be a lot of shared experience. And uh, what is also important um, in the experience of the last one year, that the autocrats and emerging autocrats and would-be autocrats uh, find the found the coronavirus just very, very helpful. It was a gift uh, to them uh, to be able to double down on centralization um, and further concentration of power, uh, power grab, asset grab in various forms. Um, now, it's also true that we witnessed uh, the first serious backlash in this year which was uh, pushing out uh, Viktor Orban's party, the Fidesz from the European People's Party. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, this was simply a consequence of um, the further increase of uh, the power of the, of the autocrats. Now, how did we arrive here? Uh, if you want, you can call it, uh, with a little bit of dramatization, the rise and fall of democracy in um, Eastern Europe. Um, I don't think it's entirely a fall, uh, but a very serious erosion of uh, democracy and the rule of law. Uh, the point is uh, not the terminology. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in my view, it is to take into account the longer perspective and not simply to start five years ago, 10 years ago, but go back to uh, the time of Fukuyama and um, enumerate the factors uh, people like Fukuyama overlooked. And obviously there were many, many Fukuyamas in Europe um, uh, as well. Uh, the number one factor, I will uh, enumerate altogether five. So the number one in my view is the question of democratic tra tradition, where the democratic tradition existed or not. So a lot of political scientists uh, might have met um, 
Easterners who happen to read um, Robert Dahl or John Rawls or Rav Darendorf at the time, but the big majority of the population didn't. And um, at the same time, at the same time, uh, the right wing traditions, uh, which were allowed to come back um, in uh, in this region, uh, were not necessarily democratic. Uh, this region had many autocratic right wing traditions. Um, and um, a lot of suppressed uh, Nazi sympathizers. And um, uh, the American journalist Paul Hockenus uh, wrote an excellent book about this, uh, which was titled Free to Hate. So instead of uh, becoming free uh, to, to build um, a democratic, liberal, uh, pluralistic system, uh, a lot of people, not only in East Germany, but also in many other countries, um, felt that now they are free to hate. So the extreme right becoming a factor again uh, after uh, several decades was a very important phenomenon from the very start. It's not only the outcome, um, but it starts in the early 1990s. The second factor I would like to highlight is the lack of coupling democratic transition with social progress. What the East was sold was the so-called Washington Consensus, broadly speaking, neoliberalism, running AMOC, um, the free market pushed on the uh, region sometimes in a very brutal uh, way, um, undermining um, uh, employment, destroying large sections of uh, the industry. And the economic uh, consequences of this um, are largely over. Uh, but the social, political, and spiritual consequences are not. Uh, the experience of uh, a decade of uh, recession, and we have to speak about the decade because uh, um, most countries in this region only managed to uh, catch up with the pre-transition uh, GDP levels after um, about 10 years, left a lot of scars and uh, allowed a lot of people uh, to um, to connect the ideas of uh, democracy and liberalism with uh, rising inequality and, um, and the lack of uh, social security. And um, the model uh, which uh, came to counter uh, the neoliberal destruction was the one offered by Vladimir Putin. And, um, and um, he built the autocratic regime in Russia on the ruins left behind by Yeltsin and um, his government. And the model he created was also a potential export product for others outside the EU, but also inside the EU. The third factor I want to highlight is that decoupling was unfortunately repeated by the European Union itself. Uh, social progress was not among the Copenhagen criteria. The Copenhagen criteria focused on politics, um, economics, uh, legal harmonization, but social policy was subject of uh, subsidiarity. And uh, um, uh, this uh, deficit um, obviously uh, appeared as, um, as, as a contradiction in the eyes of many who thought that the European Union membership uh, would come in a way to remedy um, the adversities uh, suffered in the transition of uh, the 1990s. So in a way, uh, the erosion of social rights uh, continued, the rise of inequality continued, racial segregation in countries where there is a sizable uh, Roma population in the region, especially East Central Europe and Southeast Europe uh, continued and, um, and that obviously was again feeding the more and more extreme uh, right-wing politics. Uh, number four, the European Union turned out to be unable, incapable of upholding the Copenhagen criteria after accession. Of course, the Copenhagen criteria continue to be important, but only vis-a-vis -vis those who want to become members and once you are a member, there is no enforcement mechanism until now to maintain someone on the course of um, uh, political pluralism. Um, 
uh, and as a matter of fact, although it would be a different discussion on uh, remaining a market economy either, but there's still stronger enforcement tools to uphold uh, the functioning of the market economy as compared to uh, political uh, pluralism. So not investing in deepening and defending democracy, cultivating civil society in the new member state with hindsight appears to be an important omission as well. Uh, the fight against corruption, as Katarina also pointed to this, could have been much, much more forceful, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, but I would not like to speak and leave you with the impression uh, of omissions because it's partly complicity. So it's not simply you know, deformation happening in the East and the West is shocked, but many Western governments are actively playing a role in this and very explicitly complicit in this deformation, starting with Germany. Germany in exchange of favors to German business, uh, multinational companies um, in uh, East Central Europe uh, turns a blind eye. Uh, especially Bavarian business, the Bavarian government, uh, but then um, the, the consequence of that is that because of uh, Bavarian and other, especially automotive, but not only automotive, uh, also banking plays a, an important role, especially in Hungary. Um, the economic gains uh, for a very, very long time, uh, there is a kind of protection um, from CDU, CSU, especially CSU, but the consequence of that is also CDU and the European People's Party providing a cover for Viktor Orban um, when he wants to build his illiberal regime. But Germany is not alone. The United Kingdom uh, driving uh, um, against an ever deeper union, driving towards Brexit and then fighting uh, um, uh, the European Union finds an ally in the East Central European uh, countries, um, as opposed to the Dutch, the Finns, the others, uh, the UK never criticized, formally or informally, uh, the deformation in uh, the East and the reception of um, Viktor Orban at Downing Street just a few weeks ago is a further evidence uh, that he has continued um, to, to be seen as a respectable uh, statesperson uh, by the conservatives in the UK. So if it's about undermining um, the Franco-German uh, integration, the UK finds um, an ally in this region. And then don't forget mentioning the United States of America, which is also complicit. Uh, the link here is mainly military. So you know, participation in Afghanistan and uh, various other forms of military commitment uh, buys the favors especially under the Trump administration, but not exclusively. So the West being shocked is um, a good, good uh, uh, cover story, but not really the reality uh, here. Finally, uh, and I should mention this, um, although with some hesitation, the Russian and Chinese influence, and that exactly because of the uh, ambivalence of uh, the integration in the EU, um, uh, there is in Southeast Europe, to some extent, South Visegrad, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, um, a kind of hegemonic rivalry. The latest manifestation of this is the vaccine wars or the vaccine competition, how the disputes over uh, Russian as well as Chinese vaccines is playing out um, in the region, but it's not only about vaccines, it's about finance, it's about infrastructure investment, it's about um, uh, banking, universities, and, uh, and nuclear, and um, uh, you name it. So the hegemonic rivalry obviously is a broader uh, a game uh, in the region and uh, the attraction of um, a peripheral capitalism model with lower democratic, social and environmental standards uh, resonates uh, with different parts of uh, the right-wing electorate. I'm saying this argument has to be used carefully because uh, we saw that in the United States after the election of Donald Trump, um, the Russian influence was, the, was used um, um, in order to obscure the domestic sources of Donald Trump and Trumpism. Um, so uh, 
we have to be careful, but this is obviously one of the contributing factors uh, to the deformation which we are discussing today. Now, obviously, uh, we need uh, a deep analysis, um, and um, although mainstream media commentary uh, tries to be uh, supportive for the cause of rule of law and democracy, uh, but, um, uh, but very often the commentators capture the surface, and not uh, the deeper causes of uh, the lack of democratic uh, uh, resilience. I spoke about deformation. I don't particularly like the word backsliding because uh, this region is not sliding back to any kind of pre-existing model. It's, um, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate outcome of uh, a, a process, but not necessarily a, a move backwards to any uh, previous stage uh, in uh, history. And the main uh, driving uh, factors for creating this uh, new model in my view, has its roots in the contradictions of the 1990s transition, the frustration of the domestic middle class to become the capitalist class in uh, their own countries, um, and then to build a hegemonic project around this uh, grievance. In this hegemonic project, for example, the role of churches, is absolutely not only the Catholic church, although in Poland it's obviously the Catholic church, in Hungary, it's various uh, churches which play into the hands of the autocrats very actively as, as, as allies. So I, I see no reason to exempt uh, the behavior of uh, churches and specific church leaders uh, from, uh, from uh, the um, analysis of anti pluralism and the final uh, point, uh, I think we need to be cautious that um, in the European debates, uh, we see tendencies to try to, so to speak, understand uh, the Eastern deformation as if it was a manifestation of some kind of diversity and the European Union should be a place for diversity and accepting various forms of uh, social um, existence, obviously, to legitimize uh, uh, autocratic systems on the ground of diversity is a very controversial uh, 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 idea. And in my view, it would need to be rejected uh, categorically. I thank you for the attention and I hope I managed to contribute to the discussion with uh, some useful points. Um. Many thanks for this very comprehensive overview, uh, dipping in and out in the Hungarian context, uh, which I think is very indicative of the larger trends. Uh, thank you also for reminding us that democracy withers without equality. So these two goals should not be siloed uh, in a way. Um, the predominance of badly designed models um, were coupled with a democratic promise uh, that underdelivered and gradually made it more expensive to be poor and less costly to be rich. And thank you also for reminding us that if the liberal democratic model is to remain relevant, competitive, uh, and so on, it actually has to deliver. Uh, and in the past, as you said, um, so many actors, external, internal, the EU, national member state level, and so on and so forth, have been complicit in ensuring that the model delivered, but it delivered at the expense both, expense both of the liberal and the democratic components. Um, so many thanks for this overview. Uh, thank you uh, both uh, to Ms. Bali and Dr. Ando uh, for these insightful remarks, uh, if not somewhat pessimistic. Uh, but on the basis of this uh, great overview, we can move to the panel discussion with our fantastic panelists. Uh, and I would like to give uh, the floor to the second Katarina of the event, Katarina Hofmann, joining us from the FES headquarters in Berlin, who will be the moderator for the rest of the event. Uh, Katarina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vasilis. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Katarina and uh, Laszlo. I think we already entered the debate. Um, I think it's very interesting what you said as well about you know the back steps and that uh, I think we can we can broaden that a bit later on and say that 
something that I thought is like the North is becoming a bit more like the South of the world. So agreeing with what Laszlo said, you know, corruption, the role of churches are many things that we discussed in the, in the earlier panels uh, with inputs from Asia and Latin America. But we would like to uh, step back a bit now and get an academic uh, perspective on a topic. I think it's nice how we did it. We get some empirical uh, insights. And now we expect step back and we go to, to Wolfgang Merkel. Um, Wolfgang Merkel is working on democracy and democratization. Um, he's a professor emeritus and he has uh, published lots of books and articles on democracy and crisis, challenges uh, of transformation, and also an article that I really liked and I'd like to come back later on, which uh, was named, Is Capitalism Compatible with Democracy? that Wolfgang published in 2014. And I would like to hear later on, Wolfgang, what you think about it in 2021. Um, after uh, Wolfgang has given us the presentation, we will listen to Evan Inchir. Evan is a Swedish politician from the Social Democratic Party. Uh, she was voted into the European Parliament in 2019, and she has been since serving on the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Um, so Wolfgang, first of all, um, we would like to listen to you and we would like to see your presentation. Bonnie, can you share Wolfgang's presentation, please? Perfect. Now, Wolfgang, can you um, take over? Thank you very much, Katarina, and good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm only speaking as an academic here because I consider myself as an homo politicus as well, but I try to focus on some aspects we have not stressed so far. Why do we talk now? about democratic resilience in politics, political science, or democracy research. The response is not too far-fetched, and it has been given before uh, by the speakers, because there are challenges to democracies where democracy didn't find that uh, up to now convincing responses. But stop, can we talk about democracy in singular? I don't think so, uh, because uh, the democracy in Finland, in Sweden or Denmark is not the same as we can find in the United States of America. It's not the same as we heard in Hungary, Poland, Brazilian, South Africa and uh, so forth. Therefore, I think it is analytically more enlightening to talk about democracies in plural. But having said this, nevertheless, uh, we have clear uh, empirical evidence that the global world of democracy uh, has uh, seen during the last 12 years, exactly statistically, exactly since 2008, a significant erosion in the quality of democracy. There are only a very, very few democracies, two or three, which haven't seen this decline in the quality of democracy and no wonder uh, they are coming from uh, Scandinavia. But uh, we don't know exactly what uh, democratic resilience is. Therefore, I try to define it, to understand it, and to oper operationalize it, uh, because otherwise we do not have a clear idea where to intervene and where can we strengthen democracy. Can I see the next slide, please? So these are the three steps of my explanation. What is democratic resilience? How can we strengthen it? And what can 
social democracy do spe specifically uh, about this? Uh, Andor was already uh, talking a bit about the third topic as well. Next slide, please. If we talk about uh, democratic resilience, we can distinguish three classical functions democracies have to fulfill when they are under stress. The first is they can withstand uh, stress without major institutional or procedural changes. This is not very probable, but sometimes it is possible and it changes from country to country. The second one, the, this is the one we are used to think about when we are talking about reforms. It is the ability to react through internal changes, through reforms. And the third one, uh, so if we are talk about some countries in Eastern Europe and even in Western Europe, including uh, North America, it is the ability to recover after initial uh, erosions, regressions of democracy. This is an analytical distinction, on, of course, uh, they are not mutually uh, exclusive. They, are, they can coexist at the same time. Uh, but talking about functions, it's not enough. If somebody talks about function, uh, the person has to talk about structures as well. Next slide, please. So uh, this is probably the academic part, Katarina. Here I'm trying, so to say, to shed some light into the black box of a political system. You see uh, coming from the corners, specific stress we have seen during the last 10 or 20 years, and we will see during the next uh, time to come as well. It is economic stress, it is the stress for fighting against global warming, uh, and the migration issue is not over for Europe as well. And uh, the pandemic stress is still going on. These are four major uh, stress uh, democracy has to cope with. Uh, and uh, I would argue the answers are not satisfactorily up to now. So I have in the middle, four major levels uh, of a political system where we can think about in inter in order to strengthen uh, democratic resilience or if you want democratic stability uh, if we use an old fashioned terms. The first is uh, con the constitutional uh, power then I will very briefly about the party system, civil society and civic culture and the political community. If we can see the next slide, I uh, can uh, talk about this as well. So uh, if we talk about the first level, the constitutional powers, we see uh, during now more than three decades, a decline of the power of parliaments and they lost power and uh, jurisdictions uh, to the executive uh, during these times. And this has very much to do with the internationalization of policy making where the executives and not the parliaments are playing a major role. And this disbalance between executive and legislature uh, has been exacerbated during uh, the last uh, 15 months during the pandemic crisis, whether this was justified or not, I leave it for a moment aside. Uh, 
there was certainly a strengthening of the executive. We heard quite often this Carl Schmidtian terms, uh, this is the hour of the executive. So we need a rebalancing. We need to strengthen uh, the uh, parliaments uh, in our political uh, systems. What is quite well working, and here probably I have a bit of parochial point of view, what was quite working during the pandemic in Germany were the uh, administrative courts uh, and uh, um, constitutional courts with, uh, which now interfered into policy making fighting uh, global uh, warming. So we need a rebalancing of uh, the uh, constitutional powers. Party system, but we have seen now again for two or three decades or in some countries even longer, uh, we have the emergence of right-wing populist parties uh, which are utilizing a specific deficit in our representative systems to mobilizing for their nationalist goals. And I would call not all of them uh, classical anti-system parties. Some of them are simply semi-loyal parties to democracy, which makes them to some extent even more dangerous because they can expand their electorate up to 30%, as we have seen, for example, in Switzerland or in presidential election in France. We should revive uh, the democratic opposition. And what I have observed again here in the short term during the pandemic uh, crisis, that the opposition uh, played, uh, forgot sometimes to play the constructive role of uh, opposition. They formed a, an informal grand grand uh, coalition. So I think we need a revival of democratic uh, opposition, may, mainly in parliament, but uh, on the streets as well civic culture and civil society. Uh, civic culture are the values, the ad attitudes the citizens have, and civil society is the organized, to some extent, the mobilized voice of the uh, civil uh, society. So Fridays for Future is certainly one of the most innovative, significant, uh, uh, organization of civil society uh, interfering uh, in to the agenda setting of democracies. What I here see uh, is a need that we should produce bridging social capital. Bridging social capital means uh, there should be a mutual trust across ethnic community, across uh, religious community, and not to forget across uh, different social classes. So we have in the Western well-established democracy, we have uh, social capital, mutual trust, but it's very much enclosed in specific classes, in specific ethnic communities, but this is not exactly what we need. We need bridging social capital. And we need it because the political community, the cohesiveness of the political community is at stake now. We see an erosion of political communities. We see a weakening sense of belongingness, especially to those who are, can be counted uh, under the lowest third of our society in socioeconomic terms, or those who are still discriminated by racist and xenophobic attitudes in our society. So 
uh, it is a fundamental uh, precondition for the resilience of democracy that there is a certain cohesiveness of uh, our political community and uh, the polarization we see at that time is certainly something which is going ongoing to erode uh, the cohesiveness of our political society. Last slide. What can a social democracy contribute to democratic resilience? I started saying that uh, only a very, very few uh, democracies uh, did withstand the erosion of the procedures, institutions, and substance. And we find them uh, in Scandinavia. And Scandinavia are not simply liberal democracies, this is quite important that we are talking about liberal rule of law based democracies, but they have, um, so to say, a social crown, a social base. Therefore, we can talk about and we talk about this as social democracy, not as a party, but as an organization of society and the political system. We should invest in people. And it is a scandal that still uh, the birth or fate uh, where the people are born in, in which, uh, in which families decide about their life chances. Equal life chances is a promise of democracy. And if we have equal life chances, we have a vertical mobility, which especially social democracy promised to now for decades. If we uh, come closer to it, we would make uh, democracy more resilient and we would have more defenders of the real existing uh, democracy. So political cohesion has to do a lot with and real existing equality of life uh, chances. I have talked about polarization and I see the polarization uh, in society and in uh, the uh, party within the party system as one of the diseases of uh, democracy in the 20s, uh, uh, which we are facing now. And we should not forget that the long-term erosion of democracy is now uh, put under stress, especially by what I call new uh, crisis of uh, our political regimes, especially climate and pandemics, uh, where we see uh, quite a strong polarization in migration as well in science evidence-based policy making plays an important role in the future, but this is, or let me put it this way, this is very good and I'm optimistic about this. Nevertheless, there is a risk that uh, we will see a scientification, a too much scientification of politics and a politicization of science as well. What I missed by social democracy, again, uh, in, even in Western Europe, that they were talking more about a just burden sharing coming out, the burdens coming out from these crises, then uh, social democracy should look. Who are the benefiters? Who are those who suffer from these crises? and should look for a higher taxation for the benefiters and support those who suffer. And again, this is important for uh, the people uh, developing a sense for uh, democracy. Uh, there is uh, a chance, so to say, for social democracy uh, gaining a bit more ground uh, because they have lost quite uh, some political space during the last 20 years. 
combining ecological needs uh, and technological innovation. This is a distinction towards the Greens with social policies. This should be the trademark uh, for social demo democratic policies in the next uh, years to come. And this could be also a distinction for them uh, and uh, supporting their position uh, in political competition in our democracies. Thank you very much for having the patience listening to me. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, I especially like your the slide with strengthening democratic resilience in the four levels. I think it's it's really important to that's what I meant by academic and step back. I know that you're also a a member of the core value commission of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. So you are definitely a political person and you comment regularly on, on uh, politics and you give insights on how to renew the party. But I like that slide especially because it um, made me think a lot about interventions of Friedrich Ebert Foundation. We have 100 offices worldwide and uh, we do work as exactly on these four levels of civil society, political community especially, but also, of course, with the parties uh, that are there, progressive parties, if so. And then I think, which is interesting, maybe we will go back more to some constitutional powers again, because we know that the separation of powers is in many countries under attack, and we, we face a lot of closing spaces around the world. Uh, for example, in Brazil, where I was based for four years. Um, now I would like to give the word first to Evan, and then we will we will continue our debate. But Evan, I would like to give you the chance to, to give your input. Um, of course, we have a lot of questions to you. You are unfortunate because you come from the role model uh, country of uh, social democracy, Sweden. And if so, if there's any uh, anything left in Europe uh, where social democratic parties are empowered, is the Scandinavian country, countries, of course, Spain and Portugal, but um, Germany, for example, always looks a bit more to Scandinavia than Northern European countries have more in common institutionally. Um, but you have your say, and then we might attack you with a question on the, on the government situation in Sweden, which is quite vibrant as I, as I saw. So Evan, you have, the, you have the say. Thank you very much, Katerina, and thank you for giving me the possibility to address this very important um, issue. And as you, um, as you ended up uh, your um, presentation with uh, on that, um, we also have our challenges, unfortunately, now, right now we do. Uh, and I'm proud that we are in many ways uh, role models as regards to uh, um, uh, both um, um, not until now um, uh, being giving um, movements and parties uh, in Sweden um, the far right movements and parties space to uh, um, dismantle our democracies. Um, but we see, unfortunately, um, a change also in Sweden uh, right now. Um, so we have also, unfortunately, um, some challenges that we are faced with right now. But going to the topic uh, and starting from somewhere, I would actually like to start with a more global approach. Even though, of course, uh, we are talking about democracy in the EU, uh, we should also, uh, I think uh, it's important to highlight that our democracy is very much interlinked and dependent on democratic situation in other parts of the world. So it's very much interlinked. And whatever happens in one part of the world, it affects us in the European Union. And the same, of course, goes with the European Union. Whatever happens in one country affects another country. So development in Hungary and Poland and Slovenia, of course, also affects the situation in Sweden, for example, um, uh, with uh, the far right movements who are the biggest threat uh, or the threat uh, to our resilient uh, democracies, um, cooperating with each other and even understanding the importance of cooperation. Um, before, previously, historically, um, we have seen that far right movements um, haven't really understood that approach, but with also what happened, I think, 
just a couple of days ago with a lot of extreme right movements from um, all parts of the, or different parts of Europe uh, getting together on a statement and sending even a signal on that we could, um, we might see uh, a more united far right um, in the near future within the European Parliament. Um, um, uh, th that for me at least sent, sent an indication of that things are happening. But of course the far right movement is not, um, uh, is not the core problem, it is the symptom. I would say, and what I mean with the symptom is that they're the product of that um, um, something is happening in our society. And we have been talking about strengthening the democratic institutions, but at the same time, strengthening the, it is important to strengthen the trust in those, um, or it's important to strengthen or make sure that the trust by those upholding the democratic institutions is, um, is being strengthened. Um, and what I mean with that is that um, there are quite a lot of things we need to, to do for people to feel that the democratic institution actually is serving them. First part is that we need to make sure that uh, we put social justice in practice. And the second is we need to make sure to put civil justice in practice. And that also of course includes uh, democratic engagement uh, by the people um, and therefore I we sometimes or many often we talk about liberal democracies uh, but I want to go beyond liberal democracy to show also the social part of it because it's not only enough with liberal democracies or civil rights um, or um, and so on they are very much important but it also needs the social justice part needs to go parallelly so we need to have welfare states in place for example um, we need to at the same time make sure that people are being included feeling that they are a part of the society and not being discriminated at depending on um, which background they ha have the gender they have uh, which um, sexual or orientation and so on uh, and so forth. At the same time, the political parties, I think we have quite a lot to say, and this has been addressed by many speakers already, uh, that we need to become better on, uh, in, on engaging also uh, to make sure, uh, and maybe it hasn't been said exactly in the same uh, ways, but to, for example, make sure that we do not only talk about politics or people's engagement um, uh, before the elections only, but also be, um, uh, in between the elections um, during all the years, um, so that uh, so that people feel that they are actually a part of what is happening in the society, that they are being able uh, to um, uh, to uh, influence. Uh, the change in the society to the better. So we need to we need to deliver on the social justice, have good uh, welfare states. We need to have, um, uh, yeah, civil rights um, um, tools in place uh, and strong anti -disc discrimination laws and so on and so forth. But we also need to make sure to um, engage people in what is happening. Um, with them in different ways. And today I think that the, the political parties are very much closed. Um, it is that if you wanna get engaged in pol uh, politics, you do it in some terms, or it becomes very difficult uh, to uh, get engaged. And this, uh, the, I would say the, <coughs> the amount of uh, people uh, engaging in political parties is, also, uh, is an indication on the trust in politics, the trust in those, the system that is actually meant to be there. And not only actually that is serving the people, but the political parties also have uh, the, um, uh, the responsibility to show that it, did, it serves them through um, making it open and making it um, more possible to uh, uh, to get engaged. Um, uh, so there are quite a lot of uh, things I, I think uh, I think that we we need to do. Um, and as I said in the beginning, a symptom of that all those things are not being done is 
actually called the, uh, the, uh, the um, extreme right movements, the authoritarian movements that are on rise. Uh, Poland has been mentioning, mentioned, for example, with those, uh, sorry for my English, but disgusting um, LGBTIQ free zones, the attacks in Hungary on the free press, the politicization of, uh, sorry, the politicization of uh, uh, the, ju the judicially, uh, ju the judicially, ju sorry for my English, but judiciary. Um, so, and I think the response uh, on the negative uh, on the um, negative development has been pretty well, uh, but not enough from the side of the European Union, for example, we have now a um, so-called conditionality mechanism in place, which means that uh, we should be able to um, hold in uh, money from those uh, or financial support from the European Union to those member states who are violating um, the rule of law. Um, but the term rule of law, as it is written, uh, um, uh, how it should be interpreted when it's being input, uh, implemented is broader than only a rule of law. It also includes human rights. It's only, it only also includes uh, democracy, which we from the SD, of course, are very happy for because we wanted to have a more broader um, uh, uh, mechanism that includes uh, uh, democracy, human rights, uh, and uh, rule, of, uh, rule of law. And I think it's also important that when we see a negative uh, development that we continue making our voices loud, uh, loud. And what I mean with that is that sometimes sometime get the question of, okay, so you are making quite a lot of statements from the side of the European Union, for example, but what are the statements really leading to? Uh, I talked to uh, a colleague yesterday, uh, me and some other colleagues, we bumped into one of our other colleagues from Hungary, uh, Clara Dobrev, who said that, that currently there are huge mass, mass demonstrations all over Hungary. And according uh, to uh, her and some other colleagues, um, one of the reasons of um, that many people, uh, the same also goes for Poland, um, get the, the strength is the support that also comes from outside. So sometimes even though we feel that, okay, statements um, might not concrete lead to change and strengthen of our democracies, um, they actually could lead and are leading to that those people in those countries, in, that, uh, in the, those specific countries that are currently being hit by the negative uh, spiral, um, uh, or negative policies um, that are being put in place by the far right, the authoritarian movement in those countries. Um, those people actually uh, get strengthened by that there are support from um, uh, outside the, uh, their borders. I myself sometimes, I actually, um, even though, um, and I'm very thankful for that, that Sweden have not reached the point where the Sweden Democrats, our far right movement, have yet got into a power on a national level. But I still myself feel that, um, uh, that uh, when support is being shown, um, it actually uh, leads to um, us getting the strength that I was talking, uh, talking about. And also it is in the social democratic DNA that when it is global, uh, global um, challenges, because this is a global challenge, it is a national, it is a European, but it is also a global. When it is a cross-border uh, challenge, that then we also um, need to address it cross-borderly. And it doesn't, of course, need to necessarily only be a cross-border challenge. It could be a national challenge, but it, it is, in that case also, of course, a matter of showing solidarity and helping each other, because in the end, as social democrats, a part of our DNA lays that we need, we know that um, uh, rights of all people, some people are rights of all people and vice versa, that we are not um, as human being, as, a re as countries, as regions and so on, we are not living in isolated islands. Uh, we are all a part of a big uh, mech uh, machine. So if one part of it breaks, it affects the whole machine. 
Um, with this said, and to conclude and go over to the questions more, um, as I said, there are quite a lot of things to do, but in the basis lays that we need to, um, as social democratic parties, become much better on, um, on, um, on serving the people in the sense of um, providing both social justice justice, but also civil justice, and not only get stuck on the view of um, how do we make sure to uphold liberal democracy with the liberal democratic tools, because I don't think that they, are, they would be enough. Uh, and I mean, history has shown it, and uh, also the presence is uh, showing it. When uh, poverty increases, then the far right, the extreme, the anti-democratic movement also grows, and, there, and then in that sense also pose uh, a threat to uh, our democracies. And our interpretation of democracy um, doesn't only stop on the, um, the liberal democratic interpretation, but goes beyond that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I think it was, was a very, I mean, I'm happy, yeah, because it was very balanced so far, like the four inputs we had. Perfect. Um, because you focus now on a part that we haven't heard that much before, which is very good to trust in institutions, yes, but social justice and the meaning of the welfare state. Um, I think that we are getting to the point, and I, I need to annoy all of you again um, with capitalism, because I think, Evan, from what you said, is that uh, at the end of the day, you say that one of the undermining factor, although you didn't say it is our cur current, our current economic system yeah, in a globalized world, because from all that I heard from you, it is interwined everywhere. I mean, uh, I think Laszlo already mentioned multinational companies working abroad, you know, and not paying taxes, for example, or now paying some, but uh, I don't think that's going to be let's say a huge change uh, of what Olaf Scholz uh, bargained in there. Um, maybe a minor one, a minor step, but won't change the system that we all live in. And this system is getting more and more unfair. And I think this is very obvious by what you said. And I think it's also interesting that you said that right-wing movements are only a symptom, but they're not the core of the problem. But what are they a symptom of? Maybe they're a symptom of people longing for belongingness, a nation state, you know, which might not mean that all of the people who are voting for a right-wing party are all fascists, you know, I think we have to differentiate there and see, I think we don't have another choice than, you know, understanding some of these people. Um, and then at the second point, analyze that there are some as well who are not only a result of poverty, because that's something interesting that you say, yes, also, but there are some elites, and that's something that Laszlo mentioned very clearly. And I can only say that I, I live, I saw that in Africa as well as in Brazil. Um, there's, there's also a rich elite profiting from these movements who are destroying the institutions and often from within. But it is also very rich elites that profit from our current system of a globalized economy. Um, I know that's a strong statement, but uh, for example, the banking system in Brazil was involved in getting rid of a social and more just government, you know, led by Dilma Rousseff and of course the big business. But I don't want to comment more. I think um, Katarina unfortunately left us now. So I would like to ask uh, uh, Laszlo if you would like to comment on on the other two speakers, no? Because you were it is yeah, your otherwise I would have asked Katarina as well to comment. But Laszlo, maybe you can comment or ask questions, and then uh, we can open the chat if there are people who would like to um, say something. Please use the chat already from our listeners that I can see on the right, and then we we go back to the other two, Laszlo. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. In reality, uh, I thought um, the discussion would open up. I very much agree with uh, Evin, um, uh, you know, broadening the perspective and putting everything into a global uh, perspective, because indeed uh, the, there is also kind of interconnectedness um, in terms of the broader uh, uh, trends um, in the world, which in my view just uh, 
uh, even more underlines um, the importance of uh, um, a kind of coordinated thinking, but also political action uh, to uh, uh, define, but also protect uh, uh, democratic <laughs> standards. Uh, from um, uh, Professor Merkel's uh, uh, presentation, I uh, found it uh, particularly important um, when he highlighted um, uh, the concept of democracies as opposed to one model only. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, this uh, to be reconciled with um, uh, with let's say minimum standards as we often uh, uh, speak about uh, various minimum standards in the European Union to apply uh, to uh, the quality of uh, democracy and applying uh, rule of law um, in my view is, um, is an important point for the discussion especially within the EU context but also beyond. Yeah, thank you, Laszlo. I was thinking that um, maybe we can also attack one point that we didn't hear that that much. We, we spoke a lot about different regions and one of our question was the pathways for democracy to become more stable. That's something that Katharina Bali pointed on and Wolfgang as well. And then I was thinking about the importance of external and extra regional actors. That is also part of our setup and Wolfgang, um, you gave us an insight on, on how social democracy can contribute to make democracies a uh, very important differentiation, more resilient. Um, but given the fact that the geopolit geopolitical landscape has changed so much, you know, I would like to hear from you how you see the setup, because you mentioned the difference different system of democracies, of course, and they evolved in such a different way all over the world. But now we have a clear polarization at the moment between the US and China. So the Communist Party just celebrated its 100th birthday, 100th anniversary, sorry, and has more power than ever. They're invading, um, let's say, a lot of spaces in the South, but also in Europe. I mean, it's something very interesting happening at the moment. China is really attacking via various forms of financialization many Southern European countries. Um, but also, of course, with the Belt Initiative, the no? Road and Belt Initiative going into the Balkans and other parts of um, Middle East Europe. Anyways, uh, there's the US, and you mentioned Wolfgang that they are very fragile at the moment. I just read yesterday that two thirds of Republicans still don't believe that Joe Biden is, uh, was elected in a free and fair way. And you have the strong men in Europe that Laszlo explained us so well there they're thinking. So where do you see us going with our system of social democracy? I mean, it's a very depressing geopolitical, let's say, landscape that we are facing at the moment. Do you think that, that Europe can still defend this system that you, that you showed us of resilience? Uh, is Europe still, let's say, a referee for that in this ge geopolitical set up that we see. It's quite interesting. Uh, geopolitics is an invention. The term is an invention by an rightist uh, theorist. His name is Haushofer. Uh, and it was uh, used very fast by uh, right wings in the 1920s. Uh, uh, and later on, uh, of course, in the Cold War. Of course, Europe should not simply follow the United States of America, who is now afraid, losing its uh, primary position as the superpower. And I'm completely convinced the next uh, decades will be our politics will be under the shadow of this conflict between the emerging People's Republic of China and the United States of America. But Europe has to find a third, sorry to say, a third way here in geopolitics. Uh, 
uh, and uh, they should remember what happened in the late 1960s. And uh, there was a new Ostpolitik. It was an opening and it was about cooperation. It was about trade. It was not about isolation and polarization. And this is a strategy uh, now from uh, the United States because they feel attacked in their position by uh, the People's Republic of China. Just to make it clear, uh, from a value-oriented uh, perspective, of course, I'm on the side of this, what I would call a defective democracy, but it is a democracy. And certainly a world, uh, so to say, led by a democratic uh, regime is much better than led by an autocratic regime uh, as in China. Uh, but polarization, isolation is the wrong way. If you allow, uh, Katarina, uh, can I uh, have a response to Evin in this moment? Uh, uh, and it is uh, related to your last question as well. Evin, I completely agree that the right-wing populist, the emergence of right-wing populism is a major, and you said the major uh, attack and challenge uh, to a democracy. This might be right, but there is an also a danger connected to it that we, let's call us Democrats and the democratic regimes are reacting with illiberal tools, with illiberal measures. We ban parties, we forbid them, we observe them by uh, internal secret services. And I see to some extent our camp, the, so to say the social liberal camp, is now inclined for these authoritarian illiberal measures against the illiberals. So this would mean a hollowing out of our uh, liberal ingredients. And I do see the uh, danger, and especially if we are looking to a second field, how do we fight global warming? Uh, but this is major, an, another major topic we may even stress later on because I see the temptation that we are embarking on a kind of soft authoritarianism legitimized by science. So uh, if you look to uh, Fridays for Future, to Extinction Rebellion, there is the battle cry. Uh, science has told us we simply have to follow uh, science, then we have the solution. So there are several temptations which coming from the inside of our own camp. Evan, feel free to um, answer Evan. I think that uh, you can you can comment and then we would, uh, since I don't have any questions in the chat, I would after that hand over to the to FEPS, to the young academics who wanted to share some thoughts with us. Evan, you have you have to say. Thank you. No, but I I mean I um, uh, I don't have so much uh, to say uh, in the sense of uh, something that is contradicting. At the same time though, I think that it is necessary for the society also to put down its feet of where does the um, you know, there are some far right movements that are saying that our um, our parties, yeah, are being banned, or our the uh, the freedom of speech is being banned, and so on and forth, and so forth. But racism, um, xenophobia, uh, they are not opinions; they are crimes. Um, so the question would become: How do you make sure that to address crimes and that uh, to uh, to um, at the same time as, of course, not go so far that you are banning uh, everything because ban is not either a, 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 a good option this of course from the north 
um, the legislation is the not, not the first part we are jumping up on, but we try, we would like to solve um, problems um, uh, in, uh, in other ways uh, as the primary, so primary source uh, than maybe uh, using always the legislation as the first thing. However, I think though, um, um, that some of the developments that we see in the European member states and some of the uh, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, decisions taken, for example, I don't know if uh, uh, the Professor Wolfgang was uh, maybe also referring to the uh, um, to the rule of law mechanism, which, as I mentioned, it means that we could hold in financial support to those countries who are violating the, uh, the, uh, the most fundamental pillars that the EU stands on. I actually think that um, that kind of step is very much important to show that no, none of our taxpayers' money, for example, uh, should go uh, from Sweden, shouldn't go in the pockets of uh, uh, the authoritarian Orban in Hungary or um, Kaczynski in uh, Poland and so on and so forth. Um, so I agree on the perceptions uh, that the, um, uh, the uh, harsh tools um, is not the first steps to take, but I at the same time think that, I mean, um, uh, some of the uh, um, um, opinions, uh, not only opinions, politics, and so on and so forth um, being conducted in, uh, by the far-right movements uh, is not opinions or um, uh, uh, things to normalize, but they are rather uh, crimes that needs to uh, be addressed. So there is a fine line there to always balance on not going too far. Uh, and the, the freedom is of speech, it is out of most importance to uphold it for the freedom of organization and so on and so forth to not do the same thing as the authoritarian regimes are doing. Um, so I see that perception and I of course also agree on that uh, we need to uh, be uh, be careful. Um, but in the go, I think the most important uh, is to address the core problem to why the situation looks like it does, uh, wh why uh, these movements, these parties are, are plopping up, sorry, in, uh, here and there. Um, and uh, without us addressing the core issues, then, I mean, it doesn't matter if we uh, will um, have a conditionality mechanism in place or not, for example. Um, we need to um, make sure that uh, we provide uh, social justice at the same time as we provide um, civil rights. So we need to make sure that we have uh, uphold the trust in the democratic institutions uh, in different ways. And I also, of course, totally agree that it's not only about uh, it's not only one part of the society who is uh, who is more and more voting uh, for the far right movement, but it is actually we see that it is people from all part of the society that tend to do it more and more. So there are other components, of course, than only uh, eradicating poverty or um, increasing social justice. But I think that increasing social justice would be an important tool to keep together the societies because when the society splits, uh, people feel that there is a change in our society and this um, authoritarian and anti-democratic movements appear and they easily blame in a certain part of, uh, part of the society and then they continue breaking the society more and more, more apart instead of gluing together, putting together the society through um, measures uh, that everybody gains on. And I am very firm believer on uh, Thorough welfare state actually leads to all part of society feeling that, okay, we have access to our most fundamental needs at the same time as when everybody has access to those, um, uh, those uh, uh, rights as uh, healthcare, uh, education, um, um, uh, labor, et cetera, uh, et cetera. It also leads to a secure and safe society where people do not need to be afraid of, for example, growing uh, crimes and so on. Okay, so I'm already at the point where I'm looking forward to see you in person, all of you in Brussels one day because digital uh, conferences are a headache. 
Okay, now, because I'm having now two people raising their hand in here, but I would first like to give Wolfgang, he wanted just to reply shortly, and then we have two people here in the chat. So it's Wolfgang, then Dominic, and then Laszlo, in that order, please. Wolfgang? Very, brief, very briefly, thank you. Very briefly, two points, Evan. Uh, as far as racism and violent sexism are uh, crimes, and they are crimes, and this is very well defined in our rule of law. We have the rule of law, and I'm just warning that we extend this uh, uh, repression. We have it, we just have to administer, we have to apply the rules. The second question is probably more uh, 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 problematic. The social justice you mentioned, the welfare state you mentioned. Now we know uh, historically and even theoretically, strong welfare states are only, only flourishing in nation states. And this is a debate we have in social democracy. We have uh, it uh, very sharply with the Danish example, for ex uh, with the Danish example. They are, by the way, uh, Denmark still in the varieties of democracy, quality measurement project. Uh, Denmark is still the best democracy on the globe, according to these hundreds of experts. Uh, and they voted very much for uh, keeping as much as possible uh, of the nation state. And uh, we might uh, criticize this from a cosmopolitan point of view because this is part of our soul. But the other part is social justice. And they also, Denmark is still now better than Finland, Norway, uh, and Sweden has the lowest social inequality. So uh, we have to discuss more open, how much can we close the borders and how much do we have to close the borders? We are not uh, neoliberal or liberal cosmopolitans. We are value driven cosmopolitans but we are engaged in social justice as well. And this balance is extremely difficult to find. And uh, up to now, I have to say it critically, up to now, the European Union was not very helpful when it came to the question of social justice, not to speak of immigration and so forth. Yeah, thank you, Wolfgang. Um... Very interesting point, the case of Denmark, but that, that needs another session uh, post-corona. Okay, Dominic, uh, I, I, maybe you can just shortly introduce yourself and then you have, you have to say. Uh, yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for your input. It was really valuable and really interesting to hear all your thoughts. Uh, my name is Dominic Afshari and I'm a political scientist from the University of Tübingen and also a member of the Young Academics Network of FEPS. Although this is not our input, our remarks will follow later. Uh, this is merely a question for the discussion. We heard also in the other sessions repeatedly that resilient democracies uh, hinge um, on very different things, including um, essentially a social component and social justice, um, but also uh, parties fighting for liberal democracies. Now in Europe, we face uh, the challenge though, that in many countries where um, democracies might are under threat right now or might be in the future. So for example, in Poland or even in, in France, um, market liberal parties are sometimes perceived to be the strongest opponents for anti-democratic forces. And they would of course disagree. They would probably say free markets are necessary for resilient democracies and every unnecessary state action would be a problem here. So social Democrats face this issue that they could either work together with market liberal parties that are clearly pro-liberal democracy in terms of institutions, or they could work together with clearly pro-welfare state parties that sometimes on the very far left are not necessarily pro-liberal democracy. Um, however, both might be hard to get a majority. So my very practical question would be, what are the very concrete steps social democratic actors in Europe have to take now to resolve this issue and to actually 
put the things we are preaching to the choir here into practice in politics? That is a very easy question, Dominic. I love it. Um, I think everybody's eager to answer that in one sentence. Laszlo, maybe you want to start answering that question and you had a comment as well, as far as I saw. Yes, it's, it's, it's more a comment to appreciate the discussion between uh, Wolfgang and Evin about what to be banned and what not to be banned, because uh, indeed it's not as simple as some people would uh, believe. And um, I appreciate Wolfgang's point about the enforcement, uh, that if there is law, uh, then obviously it has to be enforced. This was highly relevant in Hungary, but about 20 years ago, uh, because then it was still possible to ask, uh, you know, whether to suppress or not to suppress the extremist, uh, um, you know, manifestations. Uh, now it's vice versa. So now it's the hard right, which ponders whether to suppress or not to suppress any remnant of progressive um, uh, activities. Um, but 20 years ago, indeed, very concretely, it was about whether to eliminate, uh, you know, racist, far-right uh, manifestations in football. And since, you know, there was a tacit alliance already between the centre-right and the far-right, um, even the justice minister refrained from intervening. And then uh, in football stadiums, it continued to be possible to be extremist right-wing. Um, and those people in 2006 were called out and burned uh, the television building. Uh, so they were including increasingly used uh, you know, in, a, in a politicized context. Um, and you, you have seen some of the uh, consequences, luckily not very violently, also a few weeks ago. So I think uh, uh, indeed, um, uh, this is a very serious question, although uh, not, not a contemporary one for us. Right? So it's, a, it's a bit of a stage which is uh, behind us. And um, and uh, still relevant in other places. Yeah, Wolfgang, would you would you like to say something to that last uh, question before we move on? Uh, Dominic, uh, this is <laughs> this is one of the uh, most difficult uh, questions, uh, and. Uh, I try to give not an answer, but uh, just a remark. Uh, if we have this double attack, let's say an illiberal one on the political level and then a neoliberal one by liberals and neoliberal on the economic level, why not to uh, look for a variable geography of political alliances? If there is an attack, let's uh, uh, associate it with the right wing populists against our values of tolerance, of diversity, and so forth. Then we should form coalitions, formal and informal coalitions, political and societal uh, coalitions against this major attack. And this is because. It is an attack on the core of uh, democracy. However, some of these uh, alliance partner you will not find when you want to re, de, uh, to re regulate markets, uh, to uh, shape a more just tax system, and so forth. Uh, here you may find probably more and uh, coalition partners among even the very tra traditionalist uh, socialist or leftist parties. And they may have sometimes a strong nation state inclination. This can be accepted according to my point of view, but what cannot be accepted are alliances with social uh, right-wing populist parties. And we will see them more. They started as neoliberal right-wing populist parties. They become more and more social because they know their clientele is especially uh, among the lower middle classes. And they are very much under pressure as well. Uh, the academic middle classes is a complete different uh, 
animal uh, compared to this lower uh, uh, middle classes. So here's a red line with because they attack the liberal core of democracy. And even they have similar, have copied similar social policies. We should not uh, cooperate with them at any level. Yeah, and Dominic, I just wanted to add, I think it's really an excellent question. I mean, thank you for rounding up this uh, panel debate with that, with that question. Um, I would also just like to mention that I, I always see that after having been gone out of Europe for a decade, I worked in China, Africa and Brazil. So, and then you return to Europe and you realize that inequality is, has visibly grown. I mean, you know, I grew up in Berlin, I returned to Berlin and um, I think it is very obvious how inequality, exactly like Wolfgang says, is affecting especially the lower middle class. And one of my favorite topics at the moment where I have sleepless nights over is the disaster of the real estate market in Europe, yeah, which puts a lot of pressure, especially on families and especially in cities where people are living, not because it's so great to live in a hinterhouse in Berlin with 35 degrees, but because they have a job here and we still don't have any other solution for that. And I think that Corona made it very obvious, yeah, how, how much, that, how, how deep that pressure goes by now. And I think what, what we all can do as a social democratic family with NGOs, with think tanks, with parties, of course, but it's not only parties anymore um, who are important is, We really need to show that equality is better for everyone. And I really must say that I believe in that by heart, because if you have ever lived in the south of the world, you can see that inequality is really doing harm to people. I mean, it is creating more violence. Yeah, I mean, Latin America is the most unequal place in the world and the violence is there is absolutely devastating. And the violence goes into the, of course, into the middle class and the upper class, because that's where you can some, that's where you can get something, right? I mean, this is, absolutely obvious and you can see that in other you can also see it in china of course but that's a different level um but with corruption and other symptoms that the elites are gaining their power from but you can of course see it in africa yeah and i i really believe that europe is still the only continent where you have more equality but it is decreasing and especially for your generation i'm worried you know Uh, and for the one of my son, of course, who's a bit younger, but this kind of, uh, that we really need to show to people that it's more healthy and better for everyone. And I think this is the biggest challenge we all have. And I think that we have come well to that point and um, I really enjoyed the debate. And now uh, Dominic, actually, I don't know, I think you are summarizing the debate, right? Or is it someone else from the FEPS? Anyways, it's the FEPS, FEPS Young Academic Network, who will give us a, a small summary now. And then I wanted to hand over to Conny Reuter, um, who is the global coordinator of the Progressive Alliance to close up the panel. I enjoyed very much and um, looking forward to see all of you live one day. Thank you very much, uh, Katarina. So that's going to be me uh, speaking for FEPS, uh, Jan, to the Union Academic Network. So my name is Justin and my I'm based at the University of Glasgow and yeah, I'm part of the Union Academic Network. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, uh, so speakers and moderator for today's debate. It was really, really enlightening and I really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words, not so much of a summary, but more like remarks and, and what I'm taking away from this workshop, but also the previous one we had in other regions, so in Asia, North, um, in Africa and uh, South America. So I won't be too long. I'm aware that we're heading towards the end and it's, it's been a very engaging and thought provoking seminar. And I just need to digest some of the, the food that were shared by all the speakers. So um, bear with me. So what struck with me um, when I was listening to the great contribution today is obviously the importance of nurturing and strengthening existing democratic institutions. And I think that was a point made by Katarina Barley very well. We need to use, make use and strengthen our own tools. And that's something that she said also pointed out is a good foundation for resilience. So we need to protect it, but we also need to use it and make sure that uh, the rule of law is enforced. And I think that's something um, that I really took away here. And in this context, 
transnational institution like the European Union, but the European Court of Justice are really key. And this transnational dimension is something that we've seen across the different workshops um, here. What also strikes me uh, from this session, but the other session, is the importance of nurturing and um, strengthening uh, civil society to have like resilient democracies. And this comes with all the things we've said around addressing social inequalities, um, which are rising uh, in Europe and elsewhere, um, delivery, delivering actually on this agenda of uh, social inclusions, tax justice, equality, and, and putting uh, all values into action and really having also the citizen and communities from all ages and backgrounds on board with that and on board with us and speaking to their concern. And I think we've seen with all the remarks that uh, and thought that has been shared, that is something that is crucial to have resident democracy. And also a point that is, is, has been interesting for me is the, the providing a credible alternative, both in terms of action, but also in terms of vision. And I think Vasily started with saying we need to increase the boundaries of or the democratic imagination. And I think that's something uh, that I would definitely reflect on and that's something that's important. Um, and all, another key point for me was around learning the lesson from history and addressing um, some of the historical deficit that we, we've seen. So for example, Laszlo mentioned um, the de decoupling of democracy, liberalism with social progress in um, democratic institutions, but also in the EU. And I think that's something that is also very key. So I guess for us, it's uh, the huge task of turning the values we stand for into action. And in a way that resonates with citizens and communities that immediate and more long-term concern and seizing this moment, not to go back to the statu quo, the status quo, but to build back better and fairer society. And I think that's that's our agenda as, as progressive. So I look very much forward to continuing uh, this, this um, process uh, with the workshops and writing the, the report and, and continuing towards the, the Global Progressive Alliance Conference later on this year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Justine, uh, for this, uh, well, not free wrapping up, but building the bridge already or paving the way forward to what will be produced uh, and after this series of four conferences and what are the topics on which we will certainly need to, to continue. Because for me, the first lesson of the four stations we had in Latin America, Africa and Asia is we need to continue and to deepen uh, the issues. Uh, it was very important that we raised the question of uh, resilient democracies, because, uh, well, as Wolfgang Merkel pointed out, we are under the threat of multiple crises, uh, economic crisis, pandemic crisis. I don't like to speak migration and crisis, but, well, it's we know the, the reasons yeah, that push people to migrate, and the crisis is there and not the, the migration as such. Uh, and, well, also for sure the pandemic, yeah, which, well, in a way has changed in rapidly the way that we work together also in these formats uh, that we would not have imagined uh, two years ago. So first of all, let me thank all the speakers, let me thank the moderators and let me thank the partners, uh, FEPS, the support to, from FES and all those who have contributed uh, until now to bring it up. I think the, well, the point to reflect upon and perhaps to select topics on which we can go deeper. I think the last point of discussion which came up uh, the question democracy, where can you really um, well, uh, develop democracy? Is it in a, well, only in the frame of a nation state or is it uh, well in the how far European Union and other, let's say, uh, other net by other surroundings, uh, which are interstate cooperation or which are regional corporations, how far are they a threat to support the democracy or when do we have to come back to building nation state socialism and democracy only in the frame of a nation. I'm, well, I have no opinion on this, but I think um, we should discuss it. Um, the question also that was raised on democracy, there is not one democracy. And I think it's important. We have this, uh, the Nordic models, we have the, the Mediterranean models. We have seen also well, the, the difficult models outside of Europe who have become under threat. And we have also well, the question of institutional democracy and participatory democracy. There was a reference to civil society, and I think was changed really also in the last uh, years, is that civil society is not by definition progressive. 
Uh, we have more and more also linked to the right wing and far right. We have a reactionary civil society in all countries and they, are, they give the public support uh, in the way uh, the SR paved the way to the SS in Germany and uh, in the end of the 20s and the 30s and we see similar movements uh, all around the world again. We have also threats to democracy from actors that we in, as social democrats, socialists were not too much speaking about. The question of the churches, the question of the organized crime and the question which was not mentioned today at all, uh, what about the role of the so-called new social or sometimes as social media? Uh, what because they have uh, well they are a factor of how to say they are resonance body the echo chamber uh, of all these extremists and all these attacks trump would not have existed if the classical medias would not have related all the tweets every day and nobody would have been interested by its tweets and we can see this uh, the more provocative you are the more are you present uh, in the public sphere and i think the question how can we get again to some kind of hegemony as progressive in the public sphere. Yeah, they could quote Gramsci or refer to Gramsci and others. I think this is a challenge for social democracy because if we speak on social democracy, it is much more than only the issue of uh, well, the social question or the democratic organization. It's the question of how to build society, how to organize societies. And our political parties all around the world sometimes are too much satisfied by the idea we develop a concept of three, four major and key messages, and then we go, then we make the campaign, and then we are elected or not. And perhaps we need to step back a little bit and how political parties contribute to the development of societies and contribute to building societies. This is for me a much more challenging question than only to ask who is the next candidate and what is the next, uh, well, what is the next concept for our election campaign? I know that this, this hurts. Yeah, this, I know that our parties do not like to speak too much about it, but I think this is a really profound question. How do we build the democratic societies? And also, friends, it's not for the first time that I say it. I'm starting getting tired of hearing about the rule of law. Why? Because we should speak on the democratic rule of law or rule of democratic law. All yeah, the inter democratic systems, they develop their law system. Look to, to, to Poland, to Hungary. Uh, look also to other countries or outside of you, to the Philippines, if you want, or look to Venezuela and others. I think this is really an important point that we as progressives have to underline. If we speak on the rule of law, we have to speak on a democratic rule of law or rule of democratic law. Because if not, I, I think everybody can refer to rule of law. We know that implicitly this is what we mean, but we should be a little bit more explicit on the issue also. There's the point of uh, identity, which was raised. Well, I would suggest that we always, that we also have a reflection later on, on the question of how building not one identity. Uh, we know uh, Sebastian Ricoeur from France is with us. We know uh, the Identité Nationale of Le Pen, Father and others. Yeah? But sorry for progressives, there is not one identity. You can have multiple identities. You are not German, French, Spanish or whatsoever. You live in an environment, you have a social identity, you have a, so to say, football identity, not on the nation state, but on other levels, you have cultural identities and so on and so on. And I think the, the individual within society constitutes itself within the society with multiple identities and not only with one. And this is important to take into consideration for progressive policies. Last but not least, yes, there's not an elephant in the room, but um, I know that social democracy is always a little bit shy to raise the question, which is the systemic question. And yeah, capitalism. Yeah? And we have uh, new forms of capitalism, which is information capitalism and others. Uh, maybe also we should have a little bit more courage to, to tackle in the future this systemic issue and not, not still to stay in the, well, we, are, we do not become revolutionary. That's not the point. We are a reformist movement for sure. But um, while being reformist movement, social democratic progressive reformist movement doesn't mean that we should give up the look for, for visions and also to have ambitions, ambitions to change society and ambition to tackle the key question of power, which is where is the, not only the political power, but where is the economic power? And this has to do with democracy and economy as another issue. So I will leave it here. Uh, repeat my thanks to, to all of you. It was amazing to follow the four stations. And uh, well, I think this is Progressive Alliance. This is why those parties engaged in Progressive Alliance have set up in 2013 in Leipzig this network. 
it's a working platform of political parties. And I think this is a way really that we should understand our ambition is not only is not to, to discuss on sterile motions that everybody forgets once they are voted. Our ambition is to really become this work, global working platform of progressives because we need the time for change, changing ideas and we need this platform to rebuild a strong social democracy in the large sense, in the large with a large ambition. And I, in this sense, I think first say the first four stations were first four steps. And there will be others. So I'm looking forward to continuing cooperation. And once again, thank you very much to all who participated today. See you soon in reality in Tiergarten in Brussels. So I don't know where, but somewhere. And stay safe. Ciao, ciao.